love to travel. And recently, in the beginning of the year, I had a great trip to Australia. Now, I say I had a great trip, doesn't mean I had a great travel there. And just to keep a long story short, I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. Um, I'm from Zurich, and I uh, wanted to fly from Zurich to Australia, but there are no direct flights. So what I did is I connected through Dubai, and the first leg to Dubai, everything was great. But when arriving in Dubai, my flight was canceled. So unfortunately, now you have to imagine this, 400 people are getting off an airplane and are eager to connect to their flights to Australia. These are big planes coming in there. At the same time, when they were getting off, there was a headline that our trip had been canceled. And as that emotion started to sink in, there's, there's different emotions. So for example, when I, when I travel, I have an itinerary. And it says, you know, first leg here, second leg there. I actually believe that, and I trust that that's going to work out that way. I make plans specifically for when I arrive. And that night, I had tickets to the, uh, at, the, uh, at the Opera House of, uh, in Sydney. Uh, so first emotion, obviously, anger, annoyed, uh, unhappy. Uh, and, and, and that's, I think, what, what a lot of customers experienced and a lot of passengers experienced when they were flying. But then, what I experienced then is something that I wanted to share with you, which is the behaviors of that airline that had welcomed and, and sort of uh, um, communicated to us that, that our trip had been canceled, they had already rescheduled and rebooked all of the passengers onto that next flight out. I'd never heard of that before. I thought that was fantastic. Um, but that, it didn't stop there. There were not one, but there were five or six people on the ground there welcoming those, those guests who had arrived off of the plane to say, hey, if you want to go on to a different connection, we will help you with those rebookings. And, uh, and because the flight had continued the next day, there was a hotel needed. Those hotels were already booked as equally also the shuttle from the airport to the hotel. I mean, I was, I was first annoyed, was the first uh, uh, emotion, but then I was surprised, like, what's going on here? I mean, this is very rare for an airline to do. Um, and I was very positively surprised about that. So through that um, change in emotions that I had there, later on during the trip, I thought about this, and I said, you know what? I think I may actually travel with that airline again. And it's not so much because that flight was canceled, that's not really what I was looking for. Much more, it was because how they behaved and how they, they treated that and how they reacted to, to what needed to be done. Things can go wrong, great if people react in the right way. So what I realized then was that the behaviors of the airline and of the staff and the people that were there affected my choice about future flights, about what I would do in the future. And I assume this is similar for a number of passengers that were on that flight um, who also had to make a choice or will have to make a choice in the future. Now, I'm not here today to talk about um, the, the, the value of uh, customer service by individuals, by a small group of people. I think that's well known. What I am here to talk about and what I'd like to invite you to think about together with me is what is the impact of corporate culture, of the sum of all those behaviors, on customer choices, and then in turn, on the success of business. So let's think about behaviors. Why do, we, why do we behave the way we do? Well, first of all, I think we need to realize that behaviors is not something that, we've, um, that, that are part of our DNA. They are actually um, something we've learned. And just like a canyon has sediments, layers of sediments, um, similarly, our behaviors are layers of experiences. So we experience certain uh, behaviors from our parents when we are young, and maybe our immediate circle of friends. And from that, we learn about behaviors. Later on, when we're in a, in a, in a job, we, we start to experience the behaviors of our work colleagues, uh, our superiors, our bosses. And from that, again, we are learning. So what we can say that is that our, our behaviors are actually a function of what we are experiencing from other people behaving. And equally, when I was there in Dubai, and I experienced those really good and professional uh, behaviors towards me as a customer, they are actually a function of the behaviors of the other people within the airline. So it seems that there is a connection between the behaviors, the culture of the company, my choices as a customer, and 
and of my fellow passengers. And then on business success, because a, a, an airline needs customers to come back to be successful. So if we think about um, uh, business success for a moment, how can we measure business success? One way listed companies do that is they look at their stock price. Now, what I'd like to do now is invite you to think about, well, what actually, Im what impact does uh, corporate culture have on stock prices? Uh, there was a study done by, by Cotter and Heskett where they compared companies who had no specific intention of thinking about um, uh, corporate culture as part of their firm. There was no special attention to that. And there was another set of companies who made it a priority to think about the corporate culture, who treat it as something important. So if we look at the benchmark, the first set of firms in a, um, over a given period, 11 years, they looked at the stock price increase, and as you can see, 74% was the increase in stock price for that first set of firms. Now here's a question to you. What do you think that second number is gonna be of firms who paid attention to corporate culture? Think in your head, what is that number that you're thinking of? The first bar is quite small, so you could probably expect the next one to be higher. Now, the bar grows quite high, and I find this amazing. Corporate culture has an enormous impact on the value of a company. And we can see in this example, in this study, this is a factor 12. So if there's any investors out there today who are looking where to put their money, I mean, I would quickly get on, the, on Google and try to find out which companies are paying attention to corporate culture. That's a huge, huge impact here. Now, business, business leaders should, should really care about this, right? This is important. Well, in another study, that, actually that theme is confirmed. Business leaders do care about this. Yeah, so in a study of 100 um, board members, over 80% confirmed culture, corporate culture is important and it's a priority for, for the success of the business. They see that, they confirm that, they say it from themselves that this is important to them. Now only a fraction of that actually make it a part of their day to day. And this is just mind blowing, right? If we think about, we understand something is super important, we are confirming that, we are saying that from our, uh, ourselves, but we're only doing, very, only very little of us, very few of us are actually um, doing something about it on a day to day basis. That sounds incredible to me. Now why is that? Problem is I can't answer that question. But what I can say is, what do companies do typically with other factors, other assets of, the, of their firm? So back to our airline. What actually influences, what are assets of that airline? One of them would be the cabin, right? The way a cabin is, is um, built from the inside, the leg room that you have, all of these factors, they influence us as customers and they influence also the choices we make when we select an airline who, which we, with which we want to travel. And what do companies do? Well, typically they hire somebody and make him or her responsible to increase that, that value of that cabin, to make it more um, accessible and more interesting and more, more enjoyable for the, for the passengers. So somebody is hired and gets the responsibility to improve and increase that value of that asset, obviously in order to make uh, a long-term business success. So I ask you this, why don't we do exactly the same thing with culture? If we recognize the importance and the impact culture can have, as with our stock prices, and we confirm that this is important to us, well, why not do the same thing as with our other assets? Let's put somebody in charge. Make somebody responsible for corporate culture and getting the most value out of that for our business success. We can even call them a culture asset manager if we want. Now we might say then, okay, good, let's do that. Now, how is that person, he or she, going to be successful? Well, there's really three things that, that will make this person successful. And the first one is, it, it comes from the understanding that there is no universal culture that's gonna make every company successful. It really depends on the business strategy. So a premium airline might define their, uh, their ideal cultures and their ideal behaviors to be around uh, customer service and dealing with the special needs of the customers and really make them feel valued. Whereas a low-cost airline, they might say, our ideal behaviors are much more around getting prices down, getting costs down, so we can continuously be more efficient 
and offer our airline tickets at a better cost to the, uh, to the customers. So different strategies lead to different ideal behaviors. And that is really what the, what the executives of firms have to think about. What is their strategy and what are those ideal behaviors? And this is where the culture asset manager for the first time comes into play. They need to work with the executives to identify what are the ideal behaviors for that specific strategy. And you know what, in my experience, I'm starting to see companies realize that. So if you walk through larger corporations, you can actually see posters up on walls where it says, you know, these are our behaviors. We put ourselves in our customers' shoes. I'm sure most of us have seen something like that. Um, or we, like, we are accountable for what we do. Uh, they might even distribute booklets where it says that in a booklet, this is what we expect of you. Now the challenge is, is that if you're in the organization and you're a staff member and you receive that and you read that, you ask yourself, sure, but what does that mean to me? So maybe I'm working at the, at the front, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm responsible for sales, yeah, I can see customer uh, experience being important, but what if I work in finance or HR or IT, right? What, what if I don't have immediate customers, what does that mean to me? And this is where the, where the culture asset manager really for the second time uh, comes really important. So this is the second factor where he plays a role, is to work with the organization and the different parts of the organization to translate whatever the executives have defined, translate that into day-to-day, -day, into day-to-day -day operations. So in Dubai, that staff, those five, six people who are waiting there to help us passengers with rebookings, for them, customer experience might mean empathy, right? understanding that we're going to have a lot of angry customers now coming towards us. They're not going to be delighted that their flight was rebooked. So for them, you know, being helpful in those moments, that is what really they have to do. But what about the guys who were booking hotels? For them, customer, uh, customer support is really much more about um, booking the right hotels and maybe doing it in an efficient way so that when the people are getting off the planes, it's already done. And what about the, what about the supervisors, right? I mean, if it goes wrong, they're, they're going to hide. But ideally, what the good behaviors are, they're going to get down to the floor. They're going to join the more junior colleagues in helping them with these angry, annoyed customers and helping them rebook and reschedule their flights. So for them, it means much more supporting their more junior members and maybe dealing with the most difficult cases. So you can see the same word, customer support and customer help, can actually mean different things to different parts of the organization. And that's where the culture asset manager comes in to play such an important role to translate what it means to different parts. And this is by no means easy, and especially for large corporations, there's no way he can do that, he or she can do that on their own. So what they need to do is build up a network of other cultural champions who will help them throughout that organization in order to translate that in, into, the, into the organization. So are we done then? If we've worked with the, with the leaders and if we've worked with the organization, how, how are we completed? Well, I said there were three things, so I've only talked about two. There's one more. And the third one comes from the, from the fact that we as, as, as human beings, we're creatures of habit. And as such, the behaviors that we've learned along the way through experiences that we've made, you know, even if we're working with a culture asset manager on, on improving and getting the, the specific behaviors for that, uh, for that company, for that airline, what is there to say we don't fall back into our old habits once the culture asset manager is gone and working with different parts of the organization? And this is really where sustainability comes in. So the culture asset manager has to work on all related people topics in that firm. For example, recruiting. If in Dubai, a front office position is now vacant and opened up, and he is helping with the recruiting, he needs to make sure that the person who's hired is bringing in those types of behaviors which are relevant for that organization. So in this case, it would be empathy. Hire somebody who doesn't just have the skills, the experiences, and the education, but also the behaviors, such as empathy, to, to be able to fulfill that role. And equally, if, um, if there's somebody being promoted in the organization, right? Make sure that not somebody who's, who's the most annoying colleague gets promoted, because those, those behaviors will be taken over from the more junior staff. So somebody who's actually displaying those kinds of behaviors that we're looking for. And then he can role model that, and the rest of the more junior organization can follow that lead. 
So you can see all these related people topics around recruiting, around promotions, around talent management, incentive setting, all of that. The culture asset manager has to work with those. And typically it's the human resource, the HR function that's responsible for that. And the culture asset manager has to work with HR in order to address those topics. Now, if, if the culture asset manager is working with those three things, so on the one hand, really top down with the leaders and identifying the ideal behaviors, and then also bottom up into translating them into the organization, as well as with HR in order to make them more sustainable, he has, the, he has a chance to be really successful in creating a culture that truly affects customers' choices and in turn, the success of business. So I'd like to do a little experiment here. Let us all think about the next time when we are traveling, we're in an airport and we're experiencing the behaviors of, of the airline staff. And it doesn't matter if it's at check-in or if you're boarding the airplane or if you're inside the plane and you're, you're experiencing the behaviors of your stewards and stewardesses. You know, ask yourself, what about my customers? And it doesn't matter if you're running a firm, a department, a team, or just responsible for yourself. Those people, those services that you're bringing to those people, what are they experiencing? And what am I doing in order to support the right experiences, to foster the right culture? Am I managing culture like an asset so that whatever I'm doing can be successful and get the customers to return again? Thank you.